Thank you for having me across here. I was, I was just saying to Sean that it took me 32 years after having left Robert Bosch Boys High School to have finally cracked an invitation to speak to the school. And now I've been invited twice in 10 days. Is Austin here today? No. no okay, he's, he's bowed out of, of today. Um, I hear Paul Nikolai visas under 15 long jump record of 5.91 meters, which has stood since I think 1979 and was broken yesterday. Uh, I was at school with Paul Nikolai, who was a, a prodigious talent. Um, I had a boy better than that um, at Plumstead High School. He was a cricketer, he was under 15, and he was jumping 6 meters routinely in his cricket tackies, not even spikes. Desperately tried to persuade him to leave cricket and come across to athletics. I failed miserably. Boy's name, by the way, was Jason Dumini. <laughs> I'm rather glad that, that I failed in, in that attempt. Why are you talking about boys? What prompted the, the need or the, or the focus is it a hot topic. Is, is one of those boys high school concerned that, that there are elements of boyhood that they are missing? You feel that you need a, a, a top up. Why, why has this topic been chosen? And don't let Tracy answer that. <laughs> why this topic in particular? I think it just seems that the room is this point here and it's been posed upon people. Yes, I was going to say that. Okay, all right, all right. Because the topic resonates with me very deeply, not just because I, I am the, the archetypal product of Robert Bosch Boys High School. Because Clyde Broster, on a trick English teacher, had a profound effect on my life, both spiritually and encouraging me to become a teacher. Simon Perkin created in me my love for history. Simon Perkin is teaching his last year of matric history, age 65 this year, and I'm also teaching matric history this year. He gave me my lifelong passion and dedication to athletics as well. Tony Ryan gave me my passion for physical education, and I've taught 10,000 physical education lessons before I became a historian, before I moved into to management. I was profoundly affected by those three gentlemen in particular, and the, the whole era <coughs> and the ethos that was one of Boys High School at the time. So when you've got to create a significant budget for your staff to buy books about teenagers and about boys in particular. And your only condition must be that they must report back to you. Um, I'm certainly a product of, of some of what I've been reading in recent years. And I, I would love you to, to get your teeth into some of these books. Getting the buggers to think is brilliant. Hein Ginnott was a child psychologist of the 1960s who understood boys better than any author I've just read. You need to buy an entire set of the seven habits of highly effective teenagers. I believe it's better than Kobe's book that he wrote to adults. Our life orientation classes use it. I'm unashamedly a fan of Steve Biddulph, raising boys, manhood, etc., etc. Celia Lashley, growing gorgeous boys into good men, started the Good Men Project in Australian and New Zealand schools, touring around the boys' only schools. I'm unashamedly a fan of James Dobson, bringing up boys. The Secrets of the Teenage Brain, when it came out a number of years ago, was a very, very powerful book, and, and so on and so on, sure. And there are just so many books that will stretch our thinking and, and challenge our preconceived ideas. Okay, rules of engagement. Now that I've told you my inspiration of books and people. Um, I, I really need you to question me and to challenge me on some of my premises. Um, I'm speaking from experience. I don't hold myself out to be an expert on this. But I do have 12 years experience of the Bosch schooling and 25 years in, in education since then. And if I say something that strikes home, please say, aha. The different here that Afrikaans spreek, and this is really makkelijk, you say it, aha. Just register with me that I've, I've said something that has challenged thinking, or, let's get going. Boys, <laughs> is it nature, or is it nature? When a five-year-old boy at a rugby match gives the ref the middle finger, is that because he is instinctively edgy, aggressive, testosterone-driven, or has dad next to him just done that a couple of 
minutes ago. It, it's no wonder that, that Plato said that of all the animals, <laughs> boy is the most unmanageable. And Plato said that 2,000 years ago, and I don't think our experience of boys has, has changed dramatically since then. Basically, a, a boy is a noise with dirt on it. <laughs> at 6 a.m. in the morning with a stone against the window having written Mommy has a big fat ass on the pavement below and we will be caught between laughing at him and giving him a hiding at one and the same time. We, 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 we do know that a, a boy is the only thing that God can use to make a man. <laughs> <laughs> I know what he has under his kilt as well. I also would have taken a look. Well, boys are rough now. They, they really are. And it's our job in education to, to punish them. And these rough diamonds are somebody's boy. That, that's my boy. Who's been through seven years with, with Gavin Kerr to his benefit. My boy's second from the left. He's a physical and biological clone of me. Every boy you deal with is, is somebody's boy. But these boys... Man, that they become youths and then they become men. And my boy Ben today is no longer a rugby player. He's a, he's a hockey player. He is massively ADHD. He has massive attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He is an exceptionally good cyclist and he spent last year in detention on 25 occasions. <laughs> Principal son sat in 25 detentions in the course of last year. I'm, I'm seeing signs of maturing. The first sign is he's starting to apologize. He's starting to develop some sense of, I blew it dramatically today with my ADHD, and he's starting to apologize. Fifth week of term, and he has not been in detention yet. That's quite exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's much better to build boys than to mend men. men. And, and we are in the profession of building boys because you've got to know the later you have to mend the male species, the less your chance of success is. And the Italians that, that say that little children headache, big children heartache are exactly true. When I say this in my parents' speeches, I see parents nodding silently in assent. When our children were little, they gave us headaches. But now that they are bigger, they are giving us heartaches. Do, do we need to mend men? Are the boys that the Bosch High School is producing not, not adequate? Well, well, let's look at some male achievements then. 90% of all convictions for violence are men. 99% of those on death row are men. 94% of worldwide prisoners are men. 90% of children with behavioral problems are male. I dispute that. Teaching and coding education, I believe it's 80% the girls are catching up at an alarming rate. 90% of those in drug rehab, 90% of those in drug rehab are men. 95% of juvenile court appearances are boys. 80% of children with learning problems are boys. 80% 80, 80 of under 25 suicides are boys. That blew me away completely. I thought it was the reverse. Boys are four times more likely to be emotionally disturbed. 12 times more likely to murder. And 10 times more likely to be diagnosed as hyperactive like my son. It's no wonder that Thoreau said that the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. But why, is, why is this happening? What, what has happened in society that has led to this? Um, is, it, is it testosterone? Is it this 800% spike in your hormonal level of testosterone that happens at the age 13 to 14 that makes boys edgy, involved in risk behaviors, and aggressive? Is it the fault of the, of the fathers? South African surveys say that 10% of adult men are friends with their fathers, 
the USA Hallmark approached one of the largest prisons for Mother's Day and gave out free cards for mothers for Mother's Day. They were inundated with requests from the 94% of prisoners that were male. They thought wonderful. They came back for Father's Day, offered free cards, not one. Not one American male prisoner requested a free Hallmark card for his father to commemorate Father's Day. <clears throat> Is it a product of, of radical militant 70s feminism, where women in their desperation to prove themselves of equal worth and dignity fought aggressively against any suggestion that there were differences between the genders? And so we had an academic <coughs> freeze for 30 years on any research into gender differences, which fortunately in the last 15 years has been sorted out. Is, is this boy problem because we live in a, in a patriarchal society? We're still today 493 of the chief executive officers of Americans 500 companies are, are men. And of most relevance to us is it perhaps that our educational system is completely out of touch with, with boys today. I told you about Hein Gunnott, this, this 1960s educational psychologist whose thinking seems largely to be lost. He said, I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. My daily mood makes the weather. I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous to be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor. I can hurt or heal. I can escalate or de-escalate a crisis. Incredibly powerful words. So sad that his writing is lost today. One of my teachers back at Fisher Middle School said, we have no idea how powerful we are as staff. We stuck that up above the entrance to the staff room for that whole year. We have no idea of just how powerful we are as staff. Because we are in high school boys, I'm going to start you with an analogy. Grade 8 boys have reached the arrivals lounge, the promised land. They walk around touching and, and looking in amazement at this wonderful promised land. This new world. They don't even get to the luggage rack. They're just so amazed that they've arrived here. Grade 9 boys are lost and edgy. They are trying on one mask after another until they find the mask that fits their face. Grade 9 boys are 10 foot tall, are bulletproof, know absolutely everything, and believe that adults are one of four types of people. Killjoy, loser, Wanker or dog. <laughs> the time boys hit grade 10, they are still looking a little bit dazed, but they've clearly left somewhere. They've, they've left that grade 9 lost edginess, aggression, defiance, <coughs> tallness. They, they've left that because the frontal cortex is starting to kick in. The power of rational thought is occasionally messing with the amygdala, amygdala's emotional response. And these boys are starting to say that grade 9 didn't work for me. They're starting to settle into a mask of their own choice. They're starting to understand who they are. And by the time boys hit grade 11, they've arrived somewhere. <laughs> that they, they're starting to become fantastic human beings. We're starting to really enjoy their classes. And by the time they're in matric, to, to use C. Alashi's words, they're, they're gorgeous boys, and they're growing into good men. And we can see that, they, that they've got a profession in mind, they've got a destination in mind. They're, they're the sort of boys that I would introduce unhesitatingly to my daughter. So many of them. And I've got to remind myself that those great eights in the arrivals lounge do become these gorgeous matric boys. I've got to get them through that hell year of grade nine. And I'm going to speak about grade nine later on. I've noticed something in recent years. Grade eights stay in their arrivals lounge only till June. By the time grade eights get to the start of the third term, they spread their wings, they are challenging systems, and they are becoming the handful that we normally experience in grade nine at an earlier age. And even more disturbingly, I'm finding that sequence has dropped a grade. 
that that grade 9 dynamic extends into grade 10. And my grade 10 grade heads are experiencing as much trauma and difficulty as my grade 9 grade heads. Thank you. Is that a grade 10 grade head speaking? <laughs> And disturbingly, there's a 20% component of my boys who in matric only wake up in the month of August. They've learned to play <laughs> August, September. They've learned to play the system. Their name no longer appears on the DT list, but their work ethic is zero. They are doing the absolute minimum to get by. They have not found their groove. They have not been inspired by whatever it is I'm offering at Fisher High School, and they are coasting. They have no curfew, free access to alcohol. Many of them are enjoying the benefits of teenage sex. And I've got to get them interested in what happened at Sharpville in 1961. I'm fighting a losing battle against these modern drug dynamics going on. Come, come play Rocky for me. <laughs> I want you to tell me which movie this comes from. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best of the Who will believe this? For you to fit right here, I'd hold you up to say to your mother, this kid's going to be the best kid in the world. This kid's going to be somebody better than anybody ever knew. And you grew up good and wonderful. It was great just watching every day. It was like a privilege. Did the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world? And you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame, like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not point fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that! I'm always gonna love you no matter what. No matter what happens. You're my son, you're my blood. You're the best thing in my life. But until you start believing in yourself, you're gonna have a life. Don't forget to visit your mother. You ain't gonna believe this. Rocky Seven? That's the last one. Is, is that the last one? <coughs> Rocky Seven? When did that come out? It's only Rocky Five. It's Rocky Five. <laughs> <laughs> into his life in the space of 120 seconds, as seen there? It's a rhetorical question. You need the music. You need the music. <laughs> celebrations away from them and, and, and we left on bad terms. They did very nicely and I was chuffed with that. But I played that to them because it encapsulated, it encapsulated something that I felt about them, that they weren't rising to the challenges, that they were, they were too many of them were drifting and they were aimless. But I, I, I love the words he used. If you know what you're worth, go and get what you're worth. You've got to be willing to take hits and not point fingers and say that you aren't where you want to be because of him or her. Cowards do that, and that isn't you. 
And if you know what you're worth, go and get what you're worth. I've got so many boys sitting in front of me in the class. And I know that there are times when I need to say to them, get up, step outside. And I need to speak this white hot razor sharp truth into their lives. Because I care for them. Because that's why I'm still in education today. So my second question about Rocky is this. When last, when last in a movie, was a man shown as a strong, loving father and husband, faithful to his wife and deeply committed to his children? Name it. Come on. And I'm going to stretch this out agonizingly. When last was a man shown as a strong, loving father and husband, faithful to his wife and deeply committed to his children? I'm waiting. Brave heart. Come on, men. Come on, ladies. Bill Cosby. And some of the younger staff say, who is Bill Cosby? <laughs> I, I buy that in, yes, that is a, a notable exception. I think it's in the 50s and 60s cowboy movies. Not, not, not after the 50s and 60s cowboys movies. No. They became it. John Wayne, silent, emotionally, no, descend detached it. descendants. Yes. The, the more we think, the more we will actually find examples. But, but generally speaking, what we do see is, is that. 93% of sex scenes on television, on the movies, in the books the kids are read, are between a couple that is not married and largely between a couple that does not even have a stable relationship. We've discussed this in school. What impact does that have on you? And the answer came back straight sharp to me. Sir, sex for pleasure happens before marriage. Sex for babies happens in marriage. That is the natural cycle of life. That is what we are enjoying currently, what we are looking forward to. When we get to marriage, we understand that sex will lose its function. It's a pervasive message, and it has reached boys. The message above that is, is, is an unseen and an unheard message all too often. I will return to this. Ladies, please, please ladies, we, we can be real, we, we can be alive, we can be warm, warm, us men. We can be funny, we can be happy, we can be tender, intelligent, creative, passionate, gentle, kind and strong. Ladies, we really can. So, 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 so why are we so often gruff, awkward, emotionally out of touch, compulsively competitive, with our tough, tender balance totally out of sync? <laughs> And my last three schools, I've attempted a devotion with this message. I have failed completely. The boys have looked at me as if I'm a complete space cadet. I've tried to tell the boys that the greatest expression of strength is true gentleness. And I've failed unutterably. Possibly because I've lacked media role models to, to model that. Where is Steven Seagal? Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Where have those guys ever turned around and said, I forgive you? No, they've filled you with bullets. And they've popped you. And they've established their macho masculinity over their opponent. We desperately need to get this message through to our boys. That's all the introduction. Now I'm going to start speaking. <laughs> uh, I want to cover eight hot potatoes. Each of these we could spend an entire weekend on. I, I want you to understand that, that I'm just going to give you sample impressions that I've had over the years of them. I believe critical to teenage boys today is that we understand the barriers to learning, we understand the research into sleep, we get our schooling right, we speak to our parents clearly, we address bullying, we address what's happening in school sports, we address discipline issues, and we address teenage depression. Let's start with sleep. <coughs> Melatonin is the substance in our bloodstream which activates the need to sleep. In children it is activated around 8 p.m. In teenagers it is activated at 11 p.m. However, a teenager needs as much sleep as a pre-adolescent as a child needs. A teenager needs eight and a half to nine hours sleep per night. Does our schooling system 
and the homework could be set, allow that? Of course it doesn't. Our boys, if they are lucky, put back seven to seven and a half hours sleep a night, which means that the average teenager at Rondebosch Boys High School and at Fisher High School has sleep debt. What are the symptoms of sleep debt? Irritability, grumpiness, depression, reluctance to cooperate. Inability to absorb learning. It's particularly prevalent because your last couple of hours sleep are your REM sleep, your rapid eye movement sleep. In those two hours, your body's ability to process the information and the academic intellectual input that it had the previous day are, is consolidated. And by cutting short the teenage boy's sleep pattern, we are eliminating his ability to absorb what we taught him in class the previous day. Research in America has shown that 50% of American teenage boys are sleep deprived and are showing the symptoms of sleep deprivation, both in terms of personality malfunction and in terms of ability to absorb academic work. The solution is really simple. High school should start an hour later. It is a very simple solution. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have to radically readjust our focus on two to three hours homework a night. We're going to have to make some fundamental difference. But this is a major flaw which recent research has shown into the way we school teenagers. Um, in 1981, I was in matric here. My mother, in her wisdom from time to time, used to say, Gavin, you're not going to school today, you're going to sleep today. And she said I would sleep from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m wake up for supper, and sleep through the night again, and she'd send me back to school. The pace I was living was totally out of kilter with my body's sleep needs. Let's hit bullying. Number two. The issue with bullying is not to focus on the victim and the bully. Bullying is a community issue. We have to teach our school community to take a stance against the bullying. The, the bully is simply the boy who does not feel academically successful in class. You show me a high-performing academic student that has been a bully, and it will be the first example that I have been aware of. Less able students, less academically able students, restore their dignity by bullying. They get social kudos by establishing their authority by being a bully because they know that they cannot get it academically. And sadly, we as teachers too often reinforce their lack of <coughs> academic status. I'm preparing a series of talks at the moment on assertiveness in teenagers. There's a desperate need for this. Teenage boys know how to be aggressive. They do not know how to be assertive. And there's a mile-long difference between assertive behavior and aggressive behavior. Teenage boys need to use humor to de-escalate conflict. They need to learn the humorous quirk, not to allow a point of natural conflict between boys to escalate into something ugly. At Fisher High School this year, I've established great leadership teams. I still believe in the value of matrix, having a role model and oversight guidance function in leadership. I've created leadership structures in every grade throughout the school. There are 15 elected leaders in every grade. They meet once a fortnight, and they are asked by their grade head questions like, who or what is disturbing your ability to excel academically? And then secondly, what can you do about it? And if they identify a boy who is systematically undermining a class's right to learn, that boy is called before his peers and his peers, under the guidance of a skilled trained educator, speak razor sharp truth into that boy's life. And they say things like, John, do you know that I'm possibly failing biology because you ruined the class experience? I cannot learn when you're behaving in this fashion. Now, can we offer you help to get you up to scratch on the work? But you've got to know that you've got to stop this behavior because you're affecting all of us, not just yourself. And, and when that comes from peers, it is so much more powerful than when it comes from the expected authoritarian figurehead. And, and the last question too is, is your Rondebosch Boys High School playground safe? 
Do you know your subculture amongst your boys? Are there no-go zones where a grade eight would move with fear and terror? Do you initiate or orientate your new pupils to the school? Do you orientate them? First day in grade eight at Fisher High School, I offer grade eights instant acceptance. But it comes with instant responsibility. I tell them there is no initiation ever at Fisher High School. And if anything happens, I must be the first to hear about it. We initiate, we orientate, we don't initiate. I've taught them that if the class has a bully, one boy must go up to the bully and say, you have bullied Chris for the last time ever. And the bully will say, who says? And the whole class chimes in, we say. And when the grade sevens come to Fisher High School, I teach them that. And we role play that, we enact that. The solution to bullying is not just establishing assertive behavior in the victim, it's getting the entire school community to say that that's a no-go zone. Two down, three, parenting. I've seen far too much of this. I'm seeing far too many parents that are losing their kids along the way. And you know who's picking up those kids? We are. We're supposed to be loco parentis from 8 until 3. We've become a loco parentis for the parenting aspect of too many boys' lives. We're expected to multi now way, way beyond what educators needed to have 30 years ago. We have to be more. We have to assume a parenting role because it's gone scarily wrong. Those of you who are historians will know that 18 of the world's great cultures in history imploded from within. They were not conquered by marauding forces from outside. Moral decay and a breakdown in the family unit led to the collapse of the world's great civilizations. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure, Ian, that, that you've done some work on that as well. Too many boys say, I wish my dad would get his sense of humor back. Too many boys say, I wonder where my dad went. This grumpy old bastard sure ate him. And, and, and my boy could quite possibly and correctly have said that about me a number of times. I wonder if they can say that about us as teachers. I wonder where Mr. Fish went. I wonder where his sense of humor went. He's become such a grumpy old bastard in the classroom. We, we, we need to tell parents that your, your adolescent is going away for a while, but he will be back. He will be back. He's disappeared behind the wall of adolescence. But what you have put in to him will re-emerge. The, the, the scripture in the book of Proverbs is my absolute favorite. It's up in my office. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we need to reassure our parents and ourselves, who are teaching grade nines, that what has been put in is not lost. It will re-emerge. We've got to hang in there and, and remain tough. The, the underfathered boy probably accounts for 90% of the disciplinary trauma at my school. I'd love to know your impression, Sean, what happens here. The father is critically primary in a boy's life from the age of 6 to 14. But what happens? Fathers at that stage are distracted, are overworked, are harassed, exhausted, disinterested, and substance dependent. There's very little actual parenting happening between the age of 6 to 14 in too many families. There's nobody to talk these boys down from the precipice, to, to see their trauma in perspective, to tell them to relax, to chill back, to consider a different response. Let me give you a brilliant example. Basketball match. One boy disliked another boy, refused to pass to him. His scoring rate went from 20 a game down to 6, because the key position was not passing to him. He cut him home and he said, Dad, I'm going to smash that boy in the face. He shut me out of the game completely. He never passes to me any longer. And his dad gave him advice that he rejected for two weeks. He said, my boy, whenever you get the ball, look for him and pass the ball to him. When you go out to shoot, dummy shoot, come down, find him, call his name, John, and pass to him. And he did this in a match. They won the game. He went home and said nothing. He did exactly the same the next game. He employed the opposite spirit. We've got to teach boys to do this. 
That spirit that you're being confronted with, you've got to employ the opposite spirit to that. And this boy, instead of confronting aggressively, made the other boy look good. They mended their ways and they restored their relationship. We've got to teach boys, parents have to teach boys, to get down from the precipice, to problem solve the situations that they find. <coughs> the, these boys are aggressive, they cannot resolve conflict with humor. They have a sexist attitude to women, and women teachers at boys and at co ed schools get the worst of these boys. And I will come back to that in a moment. They cannot express appreciation, sadness, or an apology. There are 15 different emotions that men express through anger if they are not trained in emotional literacy. They are many times more likely to do all of, all of the above male achievements that I listed. The, the underfathered boy. Fathers have to be interested in what interests their son. They must invest time and money in what interests their son and they must develop an understanding of why the red bearings don't work on the trucks on their longboard skateboard and what you need to do about it. You've got to, you've got to resist your stamp collection your garden, your newspaper, your TV program, and get interested in that. <clears throat> and you've got to create pathways to other men. <clears throat> from, from 6 to 14, a boy needs his father desperately. From the age of 15, father is no longer considered a useful source of information because of the preconceived ideas. And definitely not sexual information, because dad's having sex with mom, and that's too gross to imagine. So they certainly aren't going to go to dad for advice in that sphere. Where will they go to? Well, they'll go to you now. Our role becomes a role modeling role. We have to become the heroes. Because from the age of 15 upwards, mom and dad are no longer the heroes in the same way they were when we could do no wrong in their eyes. Barriers to learning, I'm going to say very little because I'm not an authority on it. But too often, problem behavior is as a result of a learning difficulty, and not because this boy is bad. This boy has developed problems of behaving badly because he has a learning difficulty. Because he cannot find esteem in the class atmosphere, the academic atmosphere, he must find his esteem elsewhere. I have spent many hours researching ADD and ADHD because of my son. Basically, it is now fairly universally agreed that 6 to 7% of boys suffer from one of the two. That means two boys in your class, on average, suffer from ADD or ADHD. One ADHD child can drive you to resign your post as a teacher, and I'm not exaggerating. I've had staff burn out, and part of the reason has been because they did not have the capacity to handle an ADHD child in their, in their class. Um, the, the terrifying statistic confirmed across two continents, 40% of children diagnosed ADHD will be jailed by the time they turn 18. We got that? 40% of these children, 40% of the two per class that you have on average will be jailed by the time they turn 18. The average ADD child gets seven words of criticism for every one word of praise they get. Seven to one. How would we handle that, people? How would we handle receiving seven words of criticism to every single word of praise that we received? Four, schooling. Tracy asked me to be as practical as possible, and I'm, I'm going to try and move into that as much as possible. Cool, the Harvard psychologist said, boys don't cope with school are taught at a tempo that doesn't suit them, in ways that make them feel inadequate, and if they speak up or out, we send them to the principal. <coughs> that, that wasn't my experience of Rubber Wash Boys High School, but I think it is the experience all too, all too often. Children learn best what they love most. I hated two of my matric subjects at Rubber Wash Boys High School. I detested them. And that was because of the way they were taught rather than the subject matter. I have a complete negative recall towards that entire subject matter. Do your children love your subject? Do they enjoy being in your lesson? 
Your, your, your children in front of you are either visual learners, auditory learners, or kinesthetic learners. And our, and our teaching, is our teaching visual, auditory, and kinesthetic? Or are we still locked into the auditory mode? In which case we are succeeding with a limited percentage of our kids. How many of Gardner's seven multiple intelligences are we addressing in any given lesson? Or are we simply addressing the intelligence that we have? Are we simply talking from our language of intelligence? The, the research came out in the 1970s, it's never changed since then. If you lecture like I'm doing, you get 5% recall. 5% recall in the days that follow. Whereas if you get kids to teach each other in class, you get up to 90% recall. So now I teach a history essay, my children write the keywords down, then in pairs they teach the essay to each other. And as the one teaches, the other sits with their notes, complements or corrects what they're doing, and then their role is reversed. If you walk past my classroom, you'd swear that there was mayhem going on, because it is so loud. But that is real learning that takes place. And I do that just before the tests and exams, and it has produced fantastic results for me, because I'm getting them to teach others. In the June exam this year, I have allowed 20 staff members to take a day off school. 20 staff members. I gave them the option to take a day off school. The Board of Governors has agreed to bring in substitute <coughs> teachers on those days. The understanding is that you will use that day to research, to improve the way you teach your modules in terms of modern technology, in terms of multiple intelligences, in terms of bringing in all the learning styles. Ten hours, each staff member has this opportunity. All they've got to do is come back and share their excitement with me afterwards. School sport. All right. We have to limit the over-competitiveness and the elitistness of current school sports. Yes, I played rugby in one of the boys high school. I detect, I detest the obsessive focus on rugby in South African schools today. I'm deeply alarmed by the fact that size counts for everything. I'm deeply alarmed that the boys at my school, I now have to add pregnancy tests to my drug tests. Because that's the only cheap way that I'm going to pick up if my boys are using anabolic steroids. If your front row doesn't weigh 300 kilograms, your front row is nothing. Rugby should be divided into an over 75 and an under 75 kilogram weight category. Skilled individuals that do not have the physical size are now irrelevant to schoolboy rugby. It is obscene, the budgets, that some schools are spending on their rugby. It is absolutely obscene. You can see that I feel quite strongly about that. We desperately need to upgrade recreational sports and lower team sports. In grade 11, I played for Ronnie Boys High School's third team. It was the most magnificent sporting year of my school career. We flatly refused, on pain of a painting, to be promoted to the B team. <coughs> Why did we do that? Because there was no spirit in Ronnie Boys High School's B team whatsoever. The B team was the punch bag for the aspirations of the A team. So the third team at Ronnie Bosch was unbeaten, had the finest spirit of everything. We've got to encourage the lower teams at school, and we've got to encourage recreational opportunities for those boys that just are simply not competitive by nature. You, you need to reward pockets of excellence in school sport. It should not be an assumption that the first team in any sport goes on tour. Why? Have they earned it? What's their win-loss record like? Is it not your table tennis team that should be going on a tour? I played table tennis for Orange Boys High School. We were so good, we left the school's league, we played men's first league. We won men's first league as Orange Boys High School's first table tennis team. We should have been rewarded with a sports tour that year. Not the first teams in the school who had an atrocious win-loss record in that year. You've got to reward pockets of excellence or those pockets of excellence will disappear. I brought in a new ruling at school this year. 
If in a given week you bunk a lesson, you do not pull the school sports clothing over your shoulders that weekend, whether you are the first team captain or not. If you bunk a detention in that week, you do not go on the field. If you don't submit a CAS assignment in that week, you do not go on the field. Because your primary business of schooling is to be taught. And you cannot rubbish the primary expectation of school over the team will lose. And that's fine with me. That is fine with me. I have two first team rugby boys who bunked school this week to miss a geography CAS test, but were at rugby practice the afternoon. It's absolute rubbish. They may not even attend a rugby practice for, for the next week. It, it, has been, it has been received with much resistance, but that's what America does. Your score drops below a four point average, you're off the team, not for a week, not for a week. You're off the team until your average gets up again. And it doesn't matter how much of a scholarship player you are or whatever, you're off the team, Chris. It's the head of academics, can I ask, does it work the other way as well then? Help me. You've got to practice while you're excluded from school. They don't have such a problem with lucky practices. I think I would have lots of lucky practices. Right. My first rugby team has to visit a first hockey team match in the season. My first hockey team has to visit a first girls netball team in that season. My first rugby team has to, once a term, coach the under 14F rugby team. They've got to go down and they've got to coach the under 14F rugby team. Why? They've got to pay it forward. The good that you have received, you must return. We do that with the Mandela 67 minute act of service. In that week, you forfeit one of your practices. You go to a primary school in the community and you take their practice. You have to recall your origins. You have to give back for, to the teams from which you emerged. Let's get off, let's get off sports. <laughs> Discipline. Discipline. I had a full and complete stroke which left me paralyzed and speechless seven years ago. Part of the cause of that was that I was deputy principal in charge of discipline in a really tough school. And obviously at the stage I wasn't equipped to handle with it. How God miraculously healed me from that is a talk for another time. But I've got very particular views on discipline of boys. <coughs> Came about from Australian sheep farmers. We were spending millions fixing their perimeter fences, absolute millions, because their sheep just headed for the fences constantly and kept walking the fences until they found a hole that they could push at and get out of. And they were spending millions, a disproportionate amount of their income on their fencing. Stay with me with the analogy. One sheep farmer solved it all. He dug water holes and planted trees, and the sheep stopped going to the fences. Problem solved. He dug water holes. He proactively created a climate that pupils chose to be part of and felt no need to head to the fences to test the boundaries. He lured them proactively into a school climate that they readily bought into. If you have rules in your class and you have no relationship with your kids, you will get rebellion. If you have rules in your class and you have no relationship with your boys, you will have rebellion. You've got to establish a relationship together with your rules. I've used the basketball analogy on you already. We need to problem solve as first response to an incident rather than get punitive immediately. I challenge my staff this year to cut the amount of children in DT by one third. Last year we entered 2,800 children into detention. My top teacher entered 170 children in detention in the course of the year. But half of my staff never ever used the detention system. And I got them to stand up and speak. I got them to speak about alternative methods, restorative discipline methods they use. And no one can say that their classes are ill-disciplined or their pupils aren't achieving. We need to get the message to boys, I like you, I really like you. I've got an enormous problem with your behavior today. I've got a relationship with you, but I've got rules as well. 
your behavior today was an enormous problem to me. Not you, not you. I'm not rejecting you. I will always be there for you. I've got an enormous problem with how you behave today. And there are going to be some consequences for that. From the age of 13 to 15, we need more rules for girls than we need in grade 6 and 7. The age of 13 to 15, we need more rules for boys than in grade 6 and 7. However, by the time they head to 16 to 18, we've got to ease off the rules and we've got to up their level of responsibility. We want them to leave Ramagosh Boys High School as independent, responsible men. How can you do that if you still keep such a tight parameter of rules on them? You've got to ease back on your rules, but you've got to keep your level of expectation, your level of responsibility high for those boys. Does that mean different rules from the senior grades to the different grades? Of course. Of course I'm saying that. Our, our consequences need to be logical, they need to be unpleasant, they need to have an electric current, and they need to be previously understood. They've got to be previously understood. Nothing creates resentment in a teenage boy quicker than rules that have not been previously understood. <coughs> 20 years ago, I worked as a gardener at a castle in England. Um, I had to move the cattle around from one field to another. And then I had to keep them in a section. It was very simple. You had one car battery and an electric cable. And this electric cable, you set 20 centimeters above the grass. And you just cordoned off the pasture that you wanted them to eat in. The cattle would go in there. They could, they could step completely over this cable. There's no problem for them. And they could have run them up. They never did. Why? The bull, the alpha male, would go up and with his wet, snotty snout, would push the perimeter. And he'd get this electric current. And he would retreat back to his herd. And they never went to the boundary again. Would that that be true with teenage boys? <laughs> but there is truth in it. There is truth in it. Your, your consequences must bear a message. There must be a level of electric current in them. Of course it's going to be restorative, but there must be some burn. Tasers. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Where are we? I lost my notes a long time ago. Oh. You're a bad, bad boy. boy. Go out of the class. You're a bad boy. I'll suspend you. You're a bad boy. I'll expel you. No ways, people. You're a bad boy. I've got to get to know you. You're a bad boy. I've got to get to know you. Our instinctive response is I've got to isolate you. Why? You're undermining the right of the class to learn. I've, I've got to marginalize you. That's why I've got a sideline venue at Fisher High School. The ultimate statement. You've under, undermined the class's right to learn. Therefore, go. Go and do your work in a separate venue. I'll phone mummy and I'll put you in an hour's DT. No. The bad boy, we must get to know him. Because if we don't, he will cause us unending trauma. <coughs> Tracy, how long have I been speaking for? Too long. <laughs> you know, you've got about seven odd minutes left. <laughs> Depression? <laughs> 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 the most massively under, underdiagnosed teenage ailment. Approximately all 8% of teenage boys suffer from depression. That means again they're in two big class. Boys say, I'm feeling grumpy, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling stressed. They can't actually articulate the words, I'm feeling depressed today. We've got to, it, it is so easily treated in this day and age. Teenage depression is a massive factor that isn't looked at. What boys need. Boys need mum from age 1 to 5, dad from age 6 to 14, us thereafter. We are their primary role models thereafter. They need a calm, ordered environment in order to function best. They need space and time to exercise. The removal of meaningful physical education from the syllabus was a shocking decision. They need to discover their capabilities, which you do wonderfully at Robert Washington, <coughs> offer such a holistic education. They need the odd adrenaline fix. They need to express emotion. Everything is channeled through anger too often with teenage boys. Um, boys have three heroes or role models. The first is those that have what they want. 
those that have the watch, that have the drill, that have the Ferrari. Our role is to introduce them to their next two levels of heroes. The next hero is those who have excelled in their passions. It's critically important that you get the sharp palaces of life to school. Not to speak about their cricket, but to speak about their lives. And lastly, you've got to introduce boys to those whom they may want to actually become. I will finish in seven minutes, I promise. <laughs> Boy tips. Girls ask for help, they do. They queue outside my council's offices. Boys don't, they act for help. You read a boy's need for help by his actions. The finest judge for me is the absentee late cover detention. I find promo statistics every week. They tell me boys that need help. Many boys are sloppy, disorganized, and are apathetic about work, including Thomas Edison, Winston Churchill, and Albert Einstein. Two of the three were thrown out of school for that. We must be very careful not to equate disorganization with rebellion. There's a huge need for schools to teach organization. Boys live in the moment, they're unwilling to plan, we all know that. Schools need to. Got to appoint more male teachers. It's of less relevance in a boys only school. The feminization of education continues to pace. The only quality educators that I can find to appoint to my school are young females. But those are the only people that I can find out there at the moment. We've got to appoint more women to see the decisions. <coughs> just appointed Fisher High School's first ever female deputy president. Deputy president. <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> Boys need to see that women are quite capable and competent to act in senior roles and don't need men always to assume those senior positions. I've said that already. We've got to teach boys to read. Let me ask you, is your library a place where boys read, or do we still expect them to research there because nobody researches my books anymore? Last year I gave my librarian 20,000 grand. I said, go and buy novels that teenagers read. Research it. She spent a year researching and she bought 20,000 grand's worth of novels that teenagers are likely to read. Don't shoot me, ladies. We have to release female teachers from having to fight problem boys whose need is that they have a dad deficiency disorder, they have a father hunger, and they take it out on a woman. We need to rescue them from that. It doesn't emasculate you, ladies. It doesn't disempower you. It empowers you because in our presence, you may speak your lazy truths to them. That's obvious. I write F to the power of four on my blackboard each day to remind me to be firm, to be focused, to be fun, and to be friendly. Critically needed with boys. I've said that already. I've said everything.